Is the Raspberry Pi's 10-year reign finally coming to a close? Today, we introduce a challenger, the Zima board, and put it head-to-head -head against the Raspberry Pi to see which comes out on top. We'll discuss the most common mistakes home lab enthusiasts make when evaluating SBCs and how to correct those. We'll also perform a full price comparison, including the hidden costs that most reviewers ignore. Then, we'll run some performance benchmarks testing the RAM, CPU, and disk I.O. speeds. I'll even show you a 10-node supercluster I built at the end of this video. By the end of this video, you'll understand exactly which SBC makes sense for your home lab while keeping your wallet happy too. Will the Raspberry Pi maintain its grip on the throne, or will the changing SBC landscape lead to a new top dog? Let's find out. And for the sake of transparency, this video is funded by Ice Whale, aka Zima, but this was literally the extent of our conversation. And here we are. So full disclosure, I have no horse in this race. I'm simply here to tell you the facts and crack questionable jokes along the way. This is a Zima board, which is a single board computer designed to do only two things look cool and serve as your personal micro server. And I was pleasantly surprised to find 10 of these at my doorstep. So I shanked those boxes open and started tinkering. Inside the box, you get the following. A 12 volt power supply with interchangeable US, UK, EU faces, one SATA cable, the SBC itself, a user manual, and two swag stickers. Named after Zima Blue from the Netflix series Love, Death, and Robots, this little guy has adequate nerdy lore for me to respect it. Not to mention, it's built like an absolute tank. It totally gives me Nokia brick vibes. Featuring a custom cooling system that allows it to operate without a fan, which provides silent and efficient operation, it's basically one large passive heatsink. No peripherals or add-ons are needed with the Zima board. Unlike the Raspberry Pi, it comes with onboard storage and ships with an international power adapter. Not to objectify this device too much, but the anatomy of the Zima board 832 is as follows. It features a PCIe 2.0 X4 port, two SATA 3.0 ports, two gigabit ethernet ports, two USB 3.0 ports, and a mini display port featuring 4K at 60 Hertz. The dual ethernet ports make it a great platform for a personal NAS or a router. Now, you could plug a GPU into this PCIe port. Performance would be held back somewhat by the X4 interface and likely result in a CPU bottleneck, but it should work. And setting this thing up is insanely easy. You literally wire it in with ethernet, power it up, and it's available on your network. This made hooking up a bunch of them into a 10 node cluster surprisingly easy. One drawback though is there is no great way to shut this thing down. So unlike the Pi, there is no power switch. On the performance side, the Zima 832 features an Intel Celeron processor called Apollo Lake. The model's N3450, which has four quad cores running from 1.1 to 2.2 gigahertz with a two megabyte L2 cache. It also has Intel HD graphics, eight gigabytes of memory, and 32 gigabytes of onboard storage storage, and that storage is super fast. Out of the box, this thing sports a Debian-based OS dubbed Casa OS, which gives you a mission control center and provides one-click installs of fairly common applications, like BitTorrent. The OS seems to rely heavily on Docker containers, which is neat because you can install microservices via custom Docker containers fairly easily, and running containers get represented here in the UI. However, when I took this thing apart, I discovered something really interesting. See, unlike the Raspberry Pi, the Zima comes with an onboard 3 volt CMOS battery, which allows it to keep track of time even when the device is powered down. Which is why on its initial boost, it already knew the time, whereas a Raspberry Pi would need to do a server sync or have a manual clock set. So those are the broad strokes around the Zima. But how does it compare to its predecessor, the Raspberry Pi 4 Model B? Well, let's start with the elephant in the room price. After all, wasn't that one of the primary initial appeals of the Raspberry Pi? I remember buying my first Pi Zero and Pi 3 and just being stunned at how cheap they were. I even got a little Pico for only $4.17. Sadly, now production shortages coupled with contingency buying from hobbyists and wholesalers has made our Pi MSRP a thing of the past. Eben Upton, the creator of the Raspberry Pi, reminds us that the RPI Foundation is producing around 10,000 units a day, and he expects stock will return to normal levels by the end of this year. But at least for now, I think we've got to consider current availability is the new normal. And that availability is low. Lucky for us, this power vacuum is giving rise to a new era of SBCs, and I don't hate it. 
For this video, I'll be evaluating the respective flagship products, but do note the Zima has three flavors and our pies also have a few different models. On the Zima side of the house, we'll be looking at the 832, which MSRPs for about $200 soup to nuts. Although you can get a $10 discount fairly easily by opening an incognito window. Standard shipping appears to be free, which puts us at $189.90 all said and done. Now, the Raspberry Pi is where things get tricky, as we'll need to go the secondary market route, as well as purchase some peripherals to make use of our Raspberry Pi. We're gonna want a case, 32 gigabyte micro SD card, and a power supply. So the motherboard seems to average about $100, which is a long ways from its MSRP of $35, but it looks like I'll be able to snag everything I need for about $129.31, putting us at a price differential of about $60, or 22%. So on price alone, Raspberry Pi still seems to come out ahead by a healthy margin, even with the current state of the market. But what about ongoing price costs such as power consumption? Next, I'm gonna run a power consumption test to see where these two guys clock in at. Keep in mind, they're both running headless, which means no keyboard and mouse, which might draw more power and mess with our tests. Each are connected to Ethernet and have one open SSH connection with my warp terminal. So we can see that the idle power consumption for the Zima board is a little over two watts. But what happens when we pin the four CPUs and fully utilize the resources? So I'm gonna use a tool called Sysbench that's gonna allow us to do that. And on the right here, we can see the resource utilization. So let's run that script. And now we can see the four cores pinned at 100%. So we can see that when the CPUs are pinned on the Zimba board, the power consumption goes up to about 5.7 watts. So almost triples. Okay, so now we have the same situation going on for our Raspberry Pi. And we can see the idle power consumption. So I'm gonna go ahead and run the Sysbench script, which will pin the four cores of our Raspberry Pi. We can confirm that here. So when the Raspberry Pi is fully utilized, we can see it jumps up to about 6.4 watts. Many of my commenters lament that at these price points, you might be better off just buying mini PCs from HP, Dell, or Lenovo. But you have to keep in mind that these options would likely result in a higher power draw. For instance, the HP G4 600 Micro can draw 12 to 16 watts, which was on par with the power draw I saw when I hooked up 10 Zima boards into my super cluster. Which may not be a huge deal in the US, but in Europe, it can make a noticeable difference in your power bill. So one of the primary differences between these boards to consider is the CPU architecture. On one side, you have the Zima sporting an Intel x86 chip, and on the other side, you have the Raspberry Pi with the newer ARM architecture. And since Angelina Jolie prophesied the rise of ARM chips in 1995 classic movie Hackers, Risk architecture is gonna change everything. Yeah, risk is good. I'm left asking myself, when has Hollywood ever been wrong? Nonetheless, there's a real debate here. There are a number of advantages of going x86 over ARM for non-open source apps, as they just don't have ARM support, or non-x86 support is patchy. I believe x86 seems to see patches and updates more quickly, and OS availability is generally quite a bit wider. But with Apple moving towards ARM with Apple Silicon, it makes me think. ARM processors tend to be less expensive and offer better energy efficiency than x86 processors. They're also more scalable, allowing for greater customization and flexibility in designing solutions for specific needs. So for my money, I'd prefer to go with the ARM architecture given its benefits. And my MacBook Pro with M1 Max chip and 64 gigabytes of RAM seems to be doing all right. But which device objectively performs better? So I'm gonna use Linux benchmarking tool Sysbench to test the memory, CPUs, and disk IO speeds. Okay, so on the left, I'm connected to my Zima board, and on the right, I'm connected to my Raspberry Pi. So let's begin by running the CPU benchmark test. Okay, so I think the salient metric here is the events per second. And we see we got a 4300 from the Zima board and 5,900 from the Raspberry Pi. So it looks like when it comes to the CPUs, the Raspberry Pi might be ahead. Okay, now we're gonna test the memory with this performance benchmark here, which will allocate two gigabytes. 10,000 operations per second compared to the Raspberry Pi, which was 6,000 operations per second. All right, next we're gonna test disk read write speeds by writing two gigabytes of local files and seeing how long it takes. So you can see the Zima board has almost 100 megabyte per second 
write speed, whereas the Raspberry Pi seemed to be stalling out of, at about 16 megabytes per second. Probably because the, the Zima has the onboard storage and the Raspberry Pi is using that micro SD card. There's probably ways to improve that, but to be honest, most people are probably using the micro SD card, so. And so just to prove a point, I'm gonna use an alternative disk storage device. So I connected my Samsung one terabyte SSD to my Raspberry Pi, and now I'm gonna run the read-write test and see how it performs. Okay, so it's still not as fast as the Zima, but substantially faster than the micro SD card. So on performance, it looks like the Zima board does come out ahead using the out-of-the-box setups. So what can you do with a Zima board? Well, for the ultimate display of narcissism, I set up a Plex Media server just so I could watch my own YouTube videos offline on my Fire TV. I then set up a local website using Nginx. It was incredibly ugly. I then set up Pi Hole, but because it wasn't running on a Pi, I renamed it to Zima Shield, trademark pending. I also created a three node KS3 cluster using Kubernetes and Rancher that made me question every decision I've ever made in my life. So while the Zima board and other SBCs offer some impressive features, the Raspberry Pi's strong community and software support for the GPIO pins make it a valuable tool for many projects. Plus with its quasi affordable price point and hopefully long-term availability, it's hard to imagine the Pi bubble bursting anytime soon. And while some may argue that x86 processors offer more power and complexity, the trend towards power efficiency and mobile computing means that ARM processors like those used in the Raspberry Pi are becoming more and more prevalent. For my money, I also prefer the Zima to have onboard Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And as we've seen, the Pi's value lies not just in the performance, but in its extensive documentation and the strong community of makers and hobbyists that have built around it. So whether you're a seasoned maker or just getting started with SBCs, the Raspberry Pi is still a top choice for many projects. Anyways, guys, thanks for watching.